like to work with Pastor Donnell, and I usually tell them, it's fun. It's a lot of fun to work with that guy. So, hi, my name is Nigel. I am the Youth Ministries Director here at the church. Um, I have been on staff for seven years working with our junior high and high school students. Aww. Aww. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm beyond excited to be able to talk to you guys today about youth and children's ministry because uh, this is my bread and butter. This is what I love. This is what I love to do. And uh, to uh, make that day extra special, I actually wore shoes. So for those of you that know me, um, I am switching it up. I am keeping you guessing. I am messing with your heads. So welcome to Sunday morning at the Ann Arbor Vineyard. Um, I had the privilege of traveling to Chicago with Mary Jordan and a few of our uh, fantastic volunteers here at the church uh, two weeks ago to attend the Faith Forward Conference, trying to process what it means to do a new kind of children's and youth ministry. And so I'm going to share with you a little bit this morning about why we might need a new youth and children's ministry and what that could look like. Um, I want to let you know that at the beginning of the year, I was trying to figure out where I could go to um, just pour into myself a little bit, get some better resources, find some inspiration about different conferences. And there were a ton happening around the area. Um, I was really looking forward to uh, Berlin. They were hosting the Brony Fair uh, last fall, which looked fabulous. Um, Murfest is just around the corner. This is coming up in uh, North Carolina. So bring your mermaid tails out and go to Murfest. And um, I thought maybe I could even sharpen my administration skills by going to the uh, office convention in Scranton, Pennsylvania. So uh, all of these uh, look fabulous, and every one of these, actual conferences. You can truly, I swear to you, go to any of these. They are actual conferences. Um, but I eventually opted for a Faith Forward conference, um, where I was joined by five adults and one child. And I'll tell you, it's very fitting to attend a youth and children's conference with a child, something about that just seemed really right in that moment. So there is a significant portion of our strategic plan that we're dedicating towards youth and children's ministry. And so I want to talk to you this morning about what that means, because I realize that all of us have maybe different levels of interest invested in youth and children. Some of you, this is so far off your radar, you're wondering how you're going to stomach 30 minutes of the youth guy talking about youth ministry. I promise it will be relevant, all right? So... Where I want to start this morning is talking about our birth, our origins of children's and youth ministry, because we need to work together to understand just how new children and youth ministry is in the church. So if we were to take the expectation that every successful church in this era is required to have dedicated ministries to youth and children, and we compare that to the lifeline of the Christian church, we would find that this is actually a very very new idea in the history of the church. So for scale, if we took 2,000 years of the church's existence, condensed it down into 20 years, youth and children's ministries would be in their infancy. It is that new of a thing. And now this observation is important to make because it can bring us into our own very important questions. The first being, how did we get to where we are today? And the second possibly being, what does this mean for us? Now, where much of our practice of faith rests is on the commandments that we love the Lord our God with all of our heart, our soul, and our strength, and that we would love our neighbors as ourselves. And if this idea of the God that we serve should paint anything for us, I would propose that it offers us a vision of radical inclusivity because there is nothing in this framework that prevents anyone from experiencing life and grace, and goodness of God. You are not excluded because of how much or how little money you make. You are not excluded because of how healthy or how completely wrecked your body is. You are not excluded because of how skilled you are or how old or how young you are. This is a mission of belonging. And so it was for a long time that the church didn't operate with children's or youth ministries because it didn't need to. Now, that doesn't mean the church wasn't doing intentional ministry for young people. We created rites of passage within the church that are hundreds of years old. And communities would journey through these rites together. And the church played a large role in the establishment and management of orphanages and hospitals, which are beautiful parts of the church's historical legacy. But historically, it was always the observation of injustice that was the catalyst for any form of youth or children's ministry. 
It was a response to injustice. And the origin of today's children's ministry programs have their roots in such a history. So as the United States moved into the modern era, we also experienced a radical shift in the way that we understand education and the role that education was going to play in a new society. And education was no longer needed for a career in the sciences, but had become essential for developing specialized skills that would fill a vacuum in the spaces of the American workforce. The previous demands in society for skilled workers were primarily met through apprenticeships and small businesses and workshops, with college educations being required and available for the exceptional few. But moving towards an industrialized society post-Civil War, there were more job vacancies, and there were few workers to fill them. The majority of Americans at the time had an education level similar to our elementary schools. And that was only if you had the fortunate circumstance to grow up in an urban setting. And that was only a circumstance if you happen to live in a northern state. So the idea of education in the mid-1800s is nothing like we conceptualize education today. It was so radically different. And our country's first high school wasn't actually built until the 1820s. And it took a while to catch on as an essential part of our education structure. Now, it would be about another 70 years until the number of public schools equaled the number of private schools in the United States. So right around 1900, there were very few education resources available to the majority of children, while the economy was willing to pay good money to those who could acquire it. So hang with me. This is where we're going into the deep stuff. So as I mentioned earlier, schools wanted to give competitive edges to children, and they only existed in northern urban settings. So what about the rest of the country? Well, here is where the church saw an opportunity to make a difference. Access to education became a justice issue for many American churches, and this birthed what we came to know today as Sunday school. This is the exact origins of Sunday school in the Christian church. Sunday school classes were implemented by churches and under-resourced communities as a means of offering our children what our government was unable to offer, a meaningful and tangible opportunity for education. The children would attend classes as the adults socialized, and then they would participate in the liturgy, the, the worship, and the message together. So Sunday school became popular as a response to injustice, and the model only grew in popularity as years marched on. Meanwhile, the education system continued to expand and improve in one of history's most incredible ways. To illustrate this, the graduation rate of students from high school in 1910 was only at 10%. In 1910, imagine this, only 10% went through the equivalent of high school. By 1935, high school graduation rates had expanded to 40%. And in only five years, 1940, 50% of all students were graduating high school. That is a phenomenal rate of change. Anywhere, it's never been done like that in the history of the world. This is incredible. And if you're wondering about today's graduation rates, they seem to be resting right now from what I can tell between 80 and 85%. So we're not at that 100% marker yet. We still have work to do. Now, this is going to bring us up to the 1940s, which even for us amateur historians will resonate with the Second World War. And here of all places is where we find our birth of contemporary youth ministry. Because by the time the wars had concluded, global opinion regarding the optimism of human advancement had radically declined. You see, prior to the creation and the implementation of an atomic weapon, most of what we were seeing in society technologically was really fabulous. It was the time to be alive. You could attend events like the World Fair where things like the telephone, electrical outlets, the Ferris wheel, and diesel engines were introduced to the masses. This was an exciting time, perhaps compared to today, to be alive to experience new technologies. And in our optimism, we didn't think that could be reverted. So we had our world war. We had bombings in Japan, which changed society forever. And so the balloon popped. This optimism balloon popped, was shattered, and we had to rethink things. And this became a time of fear in American culture. It became a time of fear within the American church. The war had been won by America's accord, but how could we prevent the past 
from repeating itself? How could we prevent the rise and rule of another Adolf Hitler? Many at the time had given up.